Europe throughout the 18th century would see countries run by absolutist monarchies where subjects had virtually no rights at all. This century, however, would also see the emergence of the High Enlightenment, in which many great changes took place throughout Europe. From popular philosophical publications, enlightened monarchs, to new civil codes, it would eventually see the establishment of new rights for citizens and more humane perspectives being promoted. It was also a time in which severe violence existed, but which had a strong momentum towards the abolition of torture, as well as the promotion of reason as the way states need to be governed. It was nonetheless a period of great barbarity, where people were tortured to death publicly, superstition was pervasive, and human rights virtually in no way existed at all. France at this time was the largest and most powerful country in Europe, and the power and prestige of the monarchy was envied throughout Europe. This power was represented by the creation of the Palace of Versailles, built by the great-grandfather of Louis XV, Louis XIV, who died in 1715. Versailles would demonstrate the opulence and lifestyle of the aristocracy, which other monarchies envied. It was built, however, and the lives of the aristocracy's decadence enabled by the severe taxation of the poor and using what was called signorial rights as part of a feudal system in rural areas in which nobles taxed peasants working on their estates and had the right to oversee justice over these peasants, including that of corporal and capital punishment, both of which included torture. Serfdom accounted for a much smaller proportion of peasants in France in particular areas due to the hybrid economic nature of the country, but this law was operational as part of the broader feudal system where there was little recourse for peasants when oppressed or abused by a nobility. The French population consisted of up to 88% who were peasants, with a million actual serfs, or 4%, tied to a feudal land system, with most people working in similar conditions. Other skilled craftspeople also existed in cities, still extremely poor however, often with not enough to eat. Around 8% comprised the capitalist middle class, whilst only 2% represented the upper class and monarchy, as well as the clergy. This standard, to similar or lesser extents, was also echoed across Europe, with many monarchs emulating this same standard of opulence and detachment from the poor, and the complete absence of human rights. That is except for both England, where parliamentary rule, rule of law, and a constitution with rights for citizens, abolition of torture, and habeas corpus had been established since 1689 and the Swiss cantons, which had a form of direct democracy in parliaments called the Landsgemeinde, with rights for citizens. Throughout this century, however, many Enlightenment ideas spread from England throughout the rest of Europe, and were expanded upon by many other philosophers to change the way society was governed and ways of thinking. One of the earliest philosophers of this century was Voltaire, who alongside acknowledging the liberal works of Locke, cited England's example of parliamentary rule, rule of law, and rights for citizens, as the standard for France and other countries to follow. He wrote in 1733 a series of essays called Letters on the English, in which he sharply critiqued France's monarchy absolutism and praised England's governance as to what to copy. Montesquieu also referred to a work by Locke and England's separation of powers of judicial and legislative arms of government, and incorporated this into his own work. This changed slightly in England when the first Prime Minister was created in 1721, as the real wielder of executive power having come from the legislature, alongside his cabinet of ministers, which largely replaced the executive power of the king as head of state. The first state to adopt principles of the Enlightenment and emulate the liberalism of England was Prussia, in 1740. Prussia, under the reign of Friedrich the Great, would introduce the Prussian Civil Code, which abolished all torture and torturous punishments, which came into complete effect by 1752, would provide universalised judicial processes, which restricted crimes for which hanging would be used as a punishment. Death sentences could only be used for more severe crimes, such as murder. Abolished serfdom, gave religious tolerance, and gave rights to Jews and allowed for basic rights of citizens being uninfringed upon by the state. Whilst freedom of expression was tolerated, censorship existed towards criticism of the state, however, and whilst he abolished serfdom, serf simply had no lands, and despite his intentions being good and wanting to liberate peasants from suppression, the reality was that many still had to return to work for their previous lords to have the right to till their lands. Nonetheless, this was the first liberal civil code since that of England's, and would epitomise the standards of the Enlightenment, with Voltaire praising Friedrich the Great's Prussia as the system all of Europe should emulate as an enlightened monarchy. In France, frivolous detachment of the monarchy from the people allowed the emerging business class, still a small minority, to question the validity of the monarchy's excesses, but also largely considered with envy that they might have power if it wasn't for monarchy absolutism, in the same way as England's restriction of the power of the monarchy. Many of these individuals would meet in salons in Paris, whereby intellectual ideas such as those by Montesquieu and Voltaire were discussed and became fashionable. Other intellectual deliberations also occurred, with works such as the Encyclopedia by Diderot, 
was a collection of intellectual thought from thinkers such as Newton, Locke, Leibniz, and others. These salons existed elsewhere too, such as in Germany and Italy. The intellectual nature of these salons didn't so much add any intellectual or insightful thought, but they glamorized intellectualism, which became important at the time among the middle classes of Europe. Another major philosopher at this time was David Hume, who espoused the philosophy of skepticism and would become a founder of a line of thought dedicated to questioning reality. This was also a prominent foundation of atheistic thought. Alongside Hume was Adam Smith, regarded as the founder of economics and capitalism, whose philosophy critiqued the mercantilist economic system of the day, which was largely the state-driven focus on exporting goods in exchange for the extraction of wealth through competition between states over territory, and accumulating gold as part of maintaining an economic surplus. He founded the ideas of capitalism, which provided the capacity, through effective trade between nations, greater productivity, to boost a nation's wealth more effectively, mutually beneficial trade between states, and less reliance upon conquest at the expense of another state. Smith's views could arguably have accounted for greater wealth divides between classes, but his views were not intended to create the standard of current international system. Smith's notion of capitalism was a focus upon benefiting individual nations mutually, and not one at the expense of another per se. It's also less widely recognised that his work did not just advocate for laissez-faire or unrestrained capitalism, but he considered at the time that a benevolent aristocrat in a productive capitalist economy would by default be bound to redistribute wealth among the poor, as a kind of wealth redistribution system, as an integral part of capitalism. Another significant influencer of the Enlightenment throughout Europe were the Jesuit Christian schools, existent in Spain in particular, which also operated in the French, Spanish and Portuguese colonies. These schools promoted the idea that God was within each person and spread this message in Europe and its colonies. These Jesuit priests, however, came into conflict with many of the monarchs of Europe, particularly in Spain, where specific Enlightenment principles were adopted, around secular rule, and where it was seen that the word of God and individual worth questioned that of an enlightened king. These Jesuits, despite being an important influencer of the Enlightenment, were persecuted in Spain, Portugal and France, with large crackdowns. Many were able to take refuge in Prussia, under Friedrich the Great, and even Russia, under Catherine the Great, where they were still allowed to practice. This demonstrated a major irony of the Enlightenment, that while secular thought was seen as more based on rationality and scepticism, with atheism being important at the time, these attitudes would deconstruct and destroy part of the foundational forces of the Enlightenment. One of the other ironies of the Enlightenment was that even with the new ways of thinking, superstition still remained, and alongside scepticism, reason and science, some of the most barbaric proceedings would still be carried out, just like in the medieval period. People were tortured to death in dungeons, and people were still consistently tortured to death publicly by being broken on the wheel, dismembered alive, burnt at the stake, torn out with red-hot pincers, or all of these interspersed as was the case throughout most of Europe, with the exception of England and Prussia, which had already abolished torture much earlier, and places such as Venice, which had more or less ceased the practice by the previous century, despite not officially banning it. This barbarity was particularly seen in the famous case of the execution of Robert Damiens in Paris in 1757, whose execution was recorded in many publications years after, highlighting its barbarity. These public tortures as executions would exist right into the 1780s in France, as well as a few other countries in Europe. This is where the Tuscan-born Enlightenment philosopher Caesar Beccaria's influence came in, with his work on Crimes and Punishments in 1764. Following England's example, he condemned and called for an abolition of torture, but went a step further by advocating against the death penalty itself. Beccaria's work would have a huge impact not just for the time, but in influencing ways of looking at crimes and punishments in following centuries, where the nature of judicial systems today in many countries could still benefit from Beccaria's work. Other nations, after a number of years, would adopt these standards, with Denmark and Saxony abolishing torture in 1770. The next major change of the Enlightenment occurred in America, with its Declaration of Independence in 1776. The Declaration of Independence, despite the war itself being bloody, preserved the English notions of individual rights, and much of the English Bill of Rights would remain influential in the newly formed American Declaration of Unalienable Rights in its new state. This same year, further changes occurred in Europe when Austria and the Holy Roman Empire, which controlled most of Germany, under Emperor Joseph II, would too become an enlightened monarchy. Like Prussia, Austria would see torture abolished, rights given to citizens, and rights given to serfs, which liberated them from being oppressed, giving serfs freedoms and rights, the ability to move between estates, pursue careers, and choose marriage partners without consent, outlaw serfs being beaten, and gave them the right of an appeal of a court ruling, but stopped short of fully being able to abolish serfdom altogether despite many other laws introduced to abolish the economic suppression and reform the agricultural economy altogether. 
This was specifically effective in the German-speaking parts of the empire, in which peasants particularly benefited from these laws for decades. Torture was also abolished at this time in Sweden, and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which also created its own constitution in 1791. Joseph II even went as far, in 1783, as influenced by Caesar Beccaria's work, in abolishing the death penalty altogether. Joseph II also enforced religious tolerance and banned censorship. Whilst historians might refer to Friedrich the Great as being the symbol of enlightened monarchs, Joseph II was certainly the most advanced and expanded enlightenment principles more than any other monarch. Other changes occurred in Denmark, where serfdom was abolished, and Tuscany, in pre-unified Italy, in 1786, where torture was abolished there also. In 1788, France also abolished torture to extract confessions about another party, and Catherine the Great of Russia also introduced many reforms, however many of these were not fully put into practice. Another massive change occurred in 1788 in America, when its constitution was created, which included its own Bill of Rights, and established a democratic republic under its first president, George Washington. Further amendments would occur to the Constitution in 1791. This would see America as the first democratic republic created, following England in influencing the course of democracy for other parts of the world to follow in the decades and centuries to come. The High Enlightenment would be a period of great philosophical insights and changes, but also one which faced its own obstacles, as some of these principles were less given attention to, as will be seen in the next video. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to be updated with new videos.